Hello? Shall I? Oh, yeah, that sounds quite throaty, doesn't it? I quite like that. Um, listen, thanks for coming. Um, I think we'll make a start. could have a very big impact on the way the internet's governed and therefore on the human rights and democratic potential for the internet to develop in the future. So it's potentially a very momentous discussion and it's happening in one of the most kind of politicized and antagonistic, antagonistic environments in which it could happen, the UN General Assembly, where there's probably a very low level of knowledge about internet issues and internet policy but a very high degree of political competition and political awareness. So from the internet's point of view, it's not a great place for the discussion to be taking place, but it's happening. And I think it's useful for us to understand where it came from. And essentially, you know, 10, 12 years ago, the UN decided it wanted to look at uh, the information society, the information technology for development, and establish a process called the World Summit on the Information Society. And my colleague, Leia, We'll just give you a brief overview of where we've got to, and then we'll throw it open for discussion. So, Leia. Uh, so oh, uh, sorry, my name's Andrew Pulleyback. I'm the director of Global Partners Digital, which is doing what it's doing. I'm a bit, I'm a bit jet lagged, so I'm not quite. <laughs> um, and I know we'll take you in this room, and um, uh, what we've been doing is just creating a, a number of partners and people in this room is trying to engage in this process over the last couple of years since the started heating up and we're now looking to build and um, get civil society to get more engaged in this uh, in this part of the process and which is coming to a head and it's going to culminate this December in New York at the General Assembly. So what I'd like to do just quickly is kind of give a bit of a background for people who are not super familiar with the process. I don't want to spend a lot of time doing the process history because I don't have any people can read up on that and um, it's not going to be useful. We only have 45 minutes. I think that for the purpose of this session it will be We'll do a quick run, run through of, uh, of, of the process and what, what we're expecting. And then I'd just like to ask to have a conversation about where people are and what they're, what we could be doing and have a bit of a strategic um, discussion of what the possibilities for civil society engagement and promoting the public interest in this, in this space would be. Um, so just briefly going back to when the, what the WISIS is and the, how it's been set up. Um, Back in 2002, um, it was, I think, a, a, a resolution of the UN General Assembly that set up the process um, to, after recognizing, this is from the, from the resolution, recognizing the urgent need to harness the potential of knowledge and technology for promoting the goals of the UN Millennium Declaration and to find effective and innovative ways to put this potential at the service of development for all. Um, this is important because it highlights what the original and this focus on development and bringing the um, technology and use, finding ways to use technology to, um, for the purpose of development and setting this up that ICT could be a uh, focus. Um, like where we were in 2002 is quite instructive, so we were quite a, like in a different situation that we're talking about now. Um, but beyond numbers, uh, where we were in 2002, what's important is that change the political environment of what we're talking about and how uh, different actors are looking at this space because of the implications to social, political, and economic uh, elements of our society that the internet has brought, the, um, the governments are now playing a much more active role in the process. So um, where we, just quickly what happened in 2003 and 2005, um, the first phase, which was held in Geneva, um, was looking to, kind of based off of that recognition and the need to, to, convene, uh, to convene the summit, was to set up a, a set of principles for how to achieve a people-centered improvement. 
policy and development-oriented information in society. Uh, the outcomes of that first stage were the Declaration of Principles, but also plan of action uh, with uh, particular targets and action lines. They, they came up with, a, with 11 action lines to consider um, the stakeholders' role as infrastructure, uh, media, health, and diversity. And what they've also did, looked at was that who the facilitators for each of these action lines were, the different UN agencies were um, designated to implement these action lines. So that, that was in 2003. Um, what happened in between 2003 and 2005 was that several is issues that in the first phase that remained unresolved, and in particular implement governance issues, um, as well as the financial mechanism, were left unresolved and they said, okay, let's talk about that in the next phase, which would be two next years later. Um, and in the, at the beginning, I think they addressed, and the people who have been involved with me know more about this than I do, obviously wasn't involved in this phase of the witches. Um, as far as I understand, the financial mechanism element were, was addressed quite early on, and that was resolved, and what was left was the IP, so the interim governance issues. But that was the bit that almost broke the process um, in the end, the... Can I just say, was anyone at you? Yeah, it would be... Oh. How many of us were there? Oh, wow. Four, four of us were there. We were there, so, okay, so four people. And uh, can I just ask one more follow-up question? How many have been following the process in the last couple of years, or have been engaged at all? Oh, okay. Right, That's so so feel free to interrupt as well if this is... Uh, if you feel any any further elaboration of need is, is necessary. Um, but just thinking about why why this is important and what happened in two years and why this is important, kind of looking at it from a not only from a development perspective but from a governance perspective as well. This was the so Chile's agenda and the outcomes of the of that second phase. Uh, what we got was for the first time. You know, we got a definition of media governance, so when people talk about internet governance, they go back to the Chile's agenda, they go back to that definition. Whether or not it's helpful or not, because it's still relevant, is a question, right? But it does remain a reference point for anyone who's working in the internet governance field. Um, for, for all of us who have been involved in the, in the internet governance forum, it's also set up the internet governance forum, right? So um, there was a 2005 when the IGF was established, and was as a way of addressing some of the issues that were raised at the summit. Um, perhaps the last thing to mention there was that, that the process of enhanced cooperation was set up kind of a, um, in addition to the IGF. And that was, um, you know, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't want to go too much into the enhanced cooperation process because it's one of those things that I think I think it, I, mean, I, I, I think it was really a political football. Yeah. I mean, the whole battle was, should governments run the internet, or should they not run the internet? What's the government's role? There wasn't really an agreement. And so people, this, this is actually from the EU, the enhanced cooperation of the European Union phrase that describes areas beyond the treaty that the states agree to cooperate within the EU. And someone thought it was a useful phrase to borrow and apply to the internet globally. Did he actually invent the term? Did it? Um, no. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm yeah. not sure, but it did, did emerge out of that. Uh, the, uh, we wrote a paper at the time, which at the time yeah. didn't seem to go over the head like it and yeah. we were like in a conference and the society was fine. But we did write a paper at the time that said quite a bit about the uh, yeah. government. Yeah. Actually, what trying to address? What were the basic problems back then? So let me go back to the 2005 and the Tunis phase and the, and the establishment of the IGF and enhanced cooperation. What were the issues that you think people well, The IGF came out of originally from the Union and from the working group on the Japanese China. So that, that was the group that worked in the session in between 2005, 3 and 2005 and the next phase. Um, and it defined, and it laid down that definition I just, when I describe this, I, I, I point at something. These things are just 
discovery by government that governments through this society to be genetic enforced and therefore they have governments as they said, how is it governed? And then they went on the process of discovery and they discovered how is it governed. They discovered the wrong thing, so they got the process. They didn't invent it. No. It's now the old no. we're no. actually no. discovering how why the internet was so successful in the fashion that it was. And the idea of changing the start of that. And I think the idea Multi-stakeholder reference platform 
um, <laughs> also the MPP. Um, it was just facilitated by the, by the ITU, but I think that having participated in the process, it was actually fantastically inclusive. And it really was, a, was an, I think, an exemplary uh, process of how to engage with the stakeholders in, in, in the process and in the review. Um, and unfortunately, we're not likely going to see that level of openness in the, in the upcoming uh, overall review happening in New York. But perhaps with the Balkan kind of strategic engagement, we could point to that as, an, as a good example of what we could build upon um, in coming back to that. Okay, so just quickly, the UN uh, General Assembly was, back, it by, it was uh, uh, called upon, um, UN General Assembly was called upon, it um, uh, was called upon by the General Assembly to conduct an overall review this year. That was the 10 year uh, point since the original decision. And they have, last year decided how they're going to do this and the modalities for the review are that we're looking at is we're going to have a two-day high-level meeting that's going to happen at um, the chambers of the general assembly in new york in december and it's going to be preceded uh preceded by a yeah preceded by an intergovernmental preparatory process which also takes into account interest from all of the relevant list of stakeholders What's unclear at the moment is that how, how that input is going to be uh, is going to be collected, solicited, and we're not going to know that until at least June. And um, what we're expecting in terms of the timeline, uh, the June deadline is um, it's a date set by the by the modality resolution for when the uh, two co-facilitators, uh, two governmental co-facilitators, are going to be set up to decide how the how the review is gonna uh, be run from June until December, and the, and how the sorry how the intergovernmental preparatory process is gonna be run, and it's all gonna culminate in December at this business event at the UN General Assembly. Um, I think that kind of sums it up a little bit. I don't know if anyone wants to add if I missed anything out of what we know what's gonna happen. Um, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, I mean, in terms of what's going to be on the agenda, apart from, as I said, like we said, we have a few elements of what's happened so far and the assessment of implementation, and also kind of looking at what should we do next afterwards. Um, it's very likely that it's going to address unresolved issues from the from the original summit. Uh, in terms of its oh, no. And I think, as I, as I already said, like how we achieve the sensitive incidents of the LGBT society. So the executive is going to be a development aspect looking at the question of how much this framework has contributed to achieving to achieving this goal. Um, perhaps, uh, I think an important thing to, to bear in mind is that whatever framework do we have in the international system to actually support this goal, to contribute to this goal, and the answer is not very much. Um, the current discussions about the SDGs and the Sustainable Development Goals. At the moment, have only four mentions of uh, uh, ICPs. So it's not a very robust approach to, to this issue. Um, and if we think that an international framework is useful, then then this is probably our best bet. But it, it is a question of how to make it, uh, how to actually make it useful and being honest about what's worked and what hasn't. That's that's a good question. That's a million dollar million dollar well, question. So as as I said, like there is a this kind of there is it's going to, it is not the UNGA is mandated to take into account the views from all relevant list of stakeholders. But that might be just like some sort of what extent this is a that's a good question as well. There is a, I mean, one of the, a, a group of NGOs are starting to meet to talk about how to intervene in this process of engagement from that point. And obviously one of the great conversations to have would be in, in writing in this space in New York and people used to lobbying the UNGOs. 
So if there are people here who have any experience in New York, that would be, it'd be great to plug you into that group because when that happens, we need to be figuring out how to get stuff up to the And all our lessons are to make the some respect since they wanted to push for you know, the risk action that that more than that really um, so I, I think the MVP process is you know, with, with proper guidance the process is still keeping in mind at the same time that um, the process is still really important. Let me say something about the MVP, I think that it's a good I think one of the, the discussions, just a final picture about, so 
that we've started through as we've talked about them so far. We've had some discussions with a group of people in Paris. And I think, I mean, our reflection is if you, what we do too often in civil society is react to what other people do and respond to positions developed by government and other groups. And by the time we get around to responding, those positions are fixed, they're hardened, it's political negotiation, we don't really impact on it because we're always reacting to things that are done. So one of the things we try to do is to say, regardless of what we think the governments might try and do and how the process works, what is it that we would want from a review of this whole world summit? And I think we fixed on three issues. Um, one was a, a, a reinforcement of a commitment to multi-stakeholder processes and decision making, which for us is important because it recognizes that the legitimate role of civil society groups is to participate in internet policy discussions and shape the environment. Secondly, to have a strong human rights focus and say whatever arrangements are adopted, they should be, they should respect the principle that human rights apply online as well as offline, and that, that human rights should be integral to as both the governance and the engineering and the commercial and political shape of the internet. And thirdly, that there is a development agenda still, that the, the internet has now, I mean, the growth of the internet has actually slowed down. You know, it was growing at one time 12, 15% a year. Access is now down to about 3% a year. And essentially, I think the existing infrastructure of telecommunications that sustained the growth of the internet for 40% of the world's population has more or less reached the easy wins that the private sector can achieve. And to take the internet to the next 40% is gonna require something very different. Different kind of technology, different level of investment, different political requirements. If you want to lay fiber cables across the mainland of Africa, for example, that raises a whole bunch of questions of governance and political stability. So there's a, a, there's a very big development agenda, which we are framing as about access to infrastructure, affordability, and availability of relevant local content in <coughs> local languages. So it's not just a kind of an elite, an elite mechanism. So those are, the, those are the issues that the civil society groups have talked about and so far have, have decided they want to work on. And we've set up four small working groups. One on how do we get into the process, like more of a tactical advisory group, if you like, to advise us on how we actually intervene. Secondly, one to define a human rights agenda for this process proactively. The third one to develop a multi-stakeholder concept of multi-stakeholder working. And the fourth to develop a have a development agenda. So regardless of what the governments do, regardless of what the companies say, we have our our set of thoughts, views, and inputs that we want to put into the process to try and It was a, and a very ad hoc group of organizations that met in Paris at the UNESCO site. So it's, it was literally a kind of 30 or so groups who may have managed to make delegated into the four UNESCO. So this isn't to say this is that, well, everybody should, there may be other issues, maybe the wrong issues. And I mean, we would encourage anybody to set up collaboration around the issues we think is uncovered. Well, you just got the data really that you talked on to your question. It was back in um, November, December, like actually at the last IGF night meeting, uh, I was talking to uh, Nikos called Constance from ISOC, and they were, we were sitting down and talking about the IGF, uh, IGF renewal and how that's part of, the IGF renewal is part of this, this, this process, right? So whether or not the IGF gets renewed will be like, and we were sitting and saying like, well, actually we agree with this, like the benefit activity and the civil society groups have a lot in common in this, like they share a lot of common, um, common interests. So why don't we kind of come together? And so we met uh, in the fifth, like on the margins of this um, UNESCO conference, and first uh, we started talking to uh, well, ISOC and civil society groups and ICC Data Center and the Chamber of Commerce also got involved. So we actually had a civil society part of the meeting where we discussed you know, our issues and our strategies and how to approach that. And we've also had a really good, I think, two hour session with, with the different communities where we had a tech community. Uh, private sector and government uh, to discuss kind of where the common, kind of where the common interest lies and where we can collaborate going forward. But we did recognize that there might be issues that we diverge. And that's. I'm sorry, I don't, yeah. I don't want to um, take over with some questions. The, um, the question of IGF, is that a fourth group? Because 
That's the mother chip. The eye chip in here will be part of the multi state holder. So that, that's definitely clear. For all the silk starting with you guys seen for last year, agree they want the eye chip to be communicated with a longer man, with a solid mandate. And that will be looked at in that multi state. Just one thing on that. However, they can say, having said that, a number of groups did stress that we didn't want unconditional IGF members. So if we don't want the IGF to just for the sake of being there, it needs to be contributing to the process. It needs to be, yeah, there, we want the uh, recommendations that came out of the, um, uh, the, the, the working group, the different working groups on IGF groups to be implemented. That needs to be done, that needs to happen. So the IGF is not there just to exist and in such a form, although that has value in itself. Yeah. But there are kind of conditionalities even on that and on multi stakeholderism as well. So it's not just the ideal multi stakeholderism. It needs to be you know, substantiated with, uh, uh, if, I think, is it about the human rights? Yeah, the human rights. Yeah. 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 There is, a, there is something, I'm usually in the category of people who try to enter it in very cold procedure and so on. Here I would like to take a different tack. I fully support what you're what you saying. But there are two elements that I think need to be conveyed publicly or more discreetly regarding this. I find it unconscionable that 10 years after the WSIS, the format of the WSIS review is less multi stakeholder than the WSIS itself. This is unacceptable. We need to find a way for a few governments to say that this is unacceptable. Because otherwise, there is one side of the map that is talking about the multi stakeholder process. And when it comes to the UN, in New York, the very same delegation, I'm not even mentioning the country, <laughs> it can't be my own one, uh, <laughs> they say something completely different. When it comes to national discussions in the, in the UN, it's going to be completely intergovernmental and it's a perfect example. This is unacceptable. And as a matter of fact, talking about the US government, when you look at the stack of the documents that were distributed, I find it unacceptable that a meeting of UNESCO, where all the countries are part of UNESCO, on the internet, that has been requested by the government themselves, has been funded by the private sector and so on, by the usual suspects. You get Germany, you get Finland, you get the Netherlands, you get uh, Sweden, and you get Israel. These are the same only countries that have carried the whole burden of multi stakeholderism for the last 10 years. This is not acceptable. So that's a general message regarding it is not acceptable that the process 10 years later is more closed than it was before. The second thing regarding the idea I personally believe that given all the reputations of the national and regional idea, if for whatever reason there were no renewal of the mandate, the message should be, don't worry, it will happen nonetheless. So fundamentally, it will happen. And I'm volunteering here today with everybody that we know to say, if for whatever reason at the end of the year, it is not renewed, we need to all get together and find a way to organize it next year. Uh, Mexico has already theoretically volunteered. I would love a lobbying uh, uh, message that says, could Mexico please stand up and say, even if it's not renewed, we think it's useful to have it. Good point. Any, I know we've kind of thrown a lot of acronyms to Spain of uh, intimacy of the United Nations and national and I left it. I, I, I forget what most of them are, and I might be listening to so that's for the best. Uh, any questions about No, not at all. Uh, quite on the contrary, the okay. foundation of the engagement is to do what we are all done in the WSIS itself, bang on the door and explain that it makes no sense. I mean, I say it very provocatively here. Mm -hmm. I can say it very calmly. I say, are you comfortable with the fact that we 
all familiar with the multi schedule model. Again, we talked about the two years ago, and still have 10 years ago. And 10 years later, the review system, although the business was, the risk was foreign every year, even the ITU has managed the business foreign, there is multi stakeholder every year. The CSTD has written a little bit, there's the IGF, and 10 years later, the review of the full process, the justification of intergovernmental discussion, it's self strength. So, on the contrary, it's a strong engagement. And I think something else is very useful is if you are, if you work with the government in your the country, you come from your lobby and you say anything to them to, to raise these kinds of issues about their own their own policy and the way they would behave and believe them would be very useful. To remind them that there is a constituency out there that believes in human rights and so on and in multi stakeholder work. So I think quite often the governments don't get that pressure from their domestic and I think it's very important in such a politicized environment in the UN for them to be aware that these are not, this is not what governments think, this is what we think. And this is what our, our view is. So, thank you. No, I, I, I think this is a very interesting thing that got us wrong. Uh, for the four years the ITU became the conference because uh, they had the treaty with the president very close. Um, something that uh, I saw you as a country, which is chapters which are called countries that organizations in different parts of the world to actually reach out to their governments. And actually many of those chapters are well connected and the history of the nations to uh, their governments. So um, yeah, I think that it was very therapeutic for us to have the and to stay in contact with the government who can also use directly uh, from the government. Just got a couple more minutes before we yeah, so as, as Nancy mentioned, there are these bullet groups, and it's just uh, very much there as well. So she's actually leading on one of the groups on the, the one on um, multi stakeholder mechanisms. And uh, um, Marianne Franklin is leading the, from the IRS coalition, is leading on uh, the unfaithful participants coalition, is leading on the one on human rights, is leading on a over the ground lab um, objective, and Stuart Hamilton from the International Federation for Migrant Association. Yeah. He's, uh, yes, he's leading on the um, on the development of access uh, objective. So feel free to let us know if you're interested at all. We can plug you in and see how that's going. I think one of the things that we would like to do is um, put together a joint, uh, either a statement or a starting point that think, puts the pulls together these um, these three elements that Anne just mentioned, and then see how we can strategically use that to engage either the missions in New York or the president. Region General Assembly, because that's going to be an important player, and also on those to engage with other stakeholders who are interested in the process um, to see where we can find areas of agreement. Um, so, Labour and I will be here for two days. So, if you, I mean, we'd be, we have to be the junction box. So, in other words, it's one of those issues you think, oh, well, I'm interested in access issues and actually contributing or at least hearing more about that. We can connect you to the people who are working on the access issues. If your area is human rights, we can do, we can make that connection. So just let us know, and we we're, we'll make sure we connect you to the to the right to the people who are currently planning to work on this. It'll be an online thread, online discussion between different people. Yeah, so it's very easy to get involved. Very open, no membership criteria. Or anything. Great. <laughs> anyone willing to help is very welcome. Uh, it'd be really interesting if anyone has a suggestion on how to strategically approach, you know, missions in New York who have experience with that, dealing with that side of things. That would be just I think in our world we've not really dealt with New York that much, so anyone with New York experience would be really welcome. Yeah. So and anyone else? <laughs> and yeah, ideally um, we should act before the August draft. So I, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. statement or just to to be more effective or to ensure that we can have some impact. Absolutely. If anyone has been engaging or is engaging with, with their governments in this process, so I'm on um, a UK a multi stakeholder advisory committee with governments, and they have now they've already set up working groups. They have the EU uh, has a responsive paper and strategic paper already circulated with all the tactics, with everything broken down, different actors that they're going to engage with, and the, business, the businesses are organised. The businesses. I mean, so like we're behind. We 
Thank you for making that point. We want to engage in that very quickly. And we read about Zoom, Urashi, you know, it's incredible. This time we have our terms of what we are doing in the That's a, good, that's a good point. There, there isn't a single civil society portal that we're looking at. So maybe we can, we do have access to a portal called Festive, which Jeremy is the administrator of. Yeah. So that, that could be a platform that could be used to give people information in that way. Okay, can I thank you very much? Uh, thank you. And as I said, let us know if you're interested and we'll do some connections. Thank you. Thank you.